So the last time I was here inside of Factory 55, I met up with Justin and I got this sawtooth recovery bag and this kinetic recovery rope, both amazing pieces of gear. He walked me through why it's important to have really good recovery gear. Since then, I've had a year to use this stuff and I have, and I've got a lot of questions for Justin on uh, how to properly use some of this stuff because it's one thing to listen and learn and watch. It's another thing to actually do. And then I've, now that I've been out there doing a few things, I need a little bit more help. So Justin's gonna help us out with how to use the stuff in this bag and also how to properly do a kinetic rope recovery. So if you've ever met Justin, you'll realize that he never stops talking about recovery. We're about to shoot a video. I walk in and this is what he's doing right now. So Justin, the last time I was here, I got this stuff from you. And I really want to kind of continue our conversation from last time. It's been a year, so I don't remember everything we talked yeah, about. Has it been that long? I think it's been a year, but already we huh? can go back and watch the video, I guess, oh, and, then, man. and then figure it out. But before we dig into anything, I just want to ask, because I've been out there now, I've been to a few overlanding events and I see like a sea of recovery stuff that's out there being sold, new companies hitting the market. I'm just wondering like, you know, what do you think somebody out there who's looking for recovery equipment, what should they consider and how should they decide between all the brands that are out there? Part of it is really looking into uh, proper labeling. And that's one of the biggest things about the Factor 55 product line that we were so adamant about, right? All the way down from all the aluminum parts that we machine uh, and all the finishes that are done, it's lot traceability on that materials. So there's so, like a little label here is what you're saying. Yeah, so a lot of it is like looking at the label. So we're one of the only companies in the whole industry that actually uses working load limits and the minimum breaking strengths on all the material. Right, so not all labels are the same. This is what I'm finding Correct, out. Correct, yeah. So some labels will say kind of average load or like av maybe average breaking strength. Yeah, or and, they'll say, some of them will even say maximum breaking strength. Right, right, yeah. which is the same acronym. Yeah. Right? Like MBS. MBA, yeah, exactly. Like as consumers who are new to buying these products, my recommendation is look at the minimum breaking strength because that's going to be your safest number. Well, and, and, it's, and that and what that number is too is also it's the repeatable number that the this average, thing breaks right? at. Yeah, it's yeah. what that breaks at. So if you have 100 parts and you break all of them, what is the least right what's the minimum that it broke at not yeah. the maximum yeah right because well if you say something broke at forty thousand pounds it's a maximum breaking strength well what does that mean well what it, what was the minimum it broke at if it broke yeah. at 40 at the maximum what's the minimum broke if it broke at 10 at yeah. a minimum but you're saying oh well a maximum breaks forward it doesn't make any sense and you haven't like your rope has a bad day yeah dude <laughs> yeah. it breaks and you think and so there's a lot of you know, so there's a lot of confusion when it comes into that when you're looking at these labels and you're looking at this stuff that not only are you seeing those working load limits and the minimum breaking strengths but you're also seeing an individual serial number yeah so that serial number goes into every single product we manufacture for material lot traceability let's walk down this road for a second okay. say like i i have used this and it worked perfectly thank goodness got me out of a really sticky situation literally but let's say that it didn't work and it broke or something or in testing you guys broke something then you can use you not necessarily the consumer but you can use this number to go back and say okay we noticed there was a flaw from, from where this is manufactured and it's in this lot. If there's ever a problem there, we have that extra built-in assurance, right, for every every single product, for uh, soft shackles, um, the aluminum we machine the parts out of, everything is traced back to that one thing. And what that means for us, for the consumer who, who spends, you know, good money on this stuff, what that means is we can have more confidence buying it because we know that you have already pulled yeah. the lots out that aren't yeah, working. Yeah, we've tried to make it <laughs> dummy proof. Exactly, yeah. so that's why it matters for us is yeah. because we know that you're tracing that stuff and we can have more confidence in buying something. And then also take that information to build better products yeah. too. So if you're out there looking at Factor 55 or other types of recovery equipment, make sure that you look at the label, make, look at the minimum braking strength if they have it. If they don't have it, my advice is pass. Hard pass, no matter what the sale is, just pass and buy something that has a labeled minimum breaking strength and then look for this lot traceability because I think that will give you more confidence that the material that you're buying to, to use in a very sometimes dangerous recovery scenario, there's a much, much less likelihood that that's gonna fail on you. 100%. Let's talk about um, this bag, which I love and I have used, it's dirty, I got it dirty. Yeah, I see that. I just wanna start with these things, okay? So I have had a couple recovery situations where I've used these. And I, I know you told me what these were when I was here last time, but 
I don't really know what's the difference between this soft, soft shackle and this one, except for this one's beefier. So one of the things with this is that this is really for abrasion resistance, right? So when you're using this, you can actually put this around that's something a little bit sharper, yeah. right? And know that you're protecting the fibers here, where this would be like the better end to put through like the end of your hitch link. Yeah. Because now this is going through something that's got a good, generous radius. Mm -hmm. You know that this is going to be protected and that nothing's going to damage this thing while it's attached to that aluminum you piece. You literally can't do that with this. No, no, no. It no, that will work through a hitch link. I'll and I'll show you. Do you have your hitch link yep. in your bag? Bright yellow. Oh, yeah. See? High-vis safety color. Um, so the thing about this is that the trick with getting soft shackles through here, again, right, we, we can all see that the, that the standard duty, it's much more pliable, right? It's easier to compress, yeah. and that just slides right through there, no problem, Easy. right? So the same thing with that same diameter hole that's on the rest of the sh winch line shackle mounts we make too. Uh, the fiber lock can be a little sticky and kind of make it a little bit tricky, but if you get that straight to go through there, it will fit through there, right? Oh, okay. And so even with the whipping, we had to go through this whole process to make sure that the whipping was tight enough that it would stay to pass through there. So you can still use the extreme duty through there. So why use one of these? So part of it is just because it's easier to use, okay. right? It's just, it's, they're, they're just simple. They're because it's just raw fiber. It's really easy to slide and open to go through this. And then also it's cheaper to manufacture because it's less of a process. Yeah. So now you're also talking about like, you, now you're talking about your budget, right? Sure. So you're, okay. you're talking about forty dollars versus seventy dollars. Got it. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So it's a big di it's a big difference when you're adding all of these extra steps to finish the product. So that makes it much easier, um, usually on the wallet too. So yeah. okay. they can be done that way. So in that scenario, this is where you would always want to put this attaching to another vehicle. Then this one would be safe in you know basically in the body of this billet yeah. aluminum to where you don't have to worry about it being damaged because as that's in your hitch receiver no matter which way that you're pulling that radius protects these fibers and makes it easy to slide through there the other reason why to make these is because with your rrp with your pulley right just like we talked yes. about before so with your pulley now the other thing too is that you always want to use the pulley with a standard duty soft shackle. Oh, yeah. One, again, because of that knot, you don't have to worry about that dropping on the ground. And then the other thing is, is that all ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, right? 10 times fast, okay. which this is used for, is self lubricating. So when you're using the RRP, that oh, becomes, yeah. it acts as the bearing in the pulley. Right. Where if you use this with the RRP, the problem is that with that polyester jacket and the fiber lock, you're introducing friction in the system. Yeah. So you want to eliminate as much friction as possible. So that's again, another reason why you want to have raw fibers, you know, attaching to the, the pulley. Dude, I'm so glad you're scenario. going through this because, because I didn't know this. And so not all shackles are created equal. So this is a utility player. This is a more kind of, um, you know, rough and tough uh, type. And then you've got like, you've got soft shackles that are rated for 16, I don't know, 20,000 pounds. Then you've got other stuff too. Oh yeah, right? so just like this, right? What you're seeing, this is the extreme duty soft shackle. Uh -huh. This little thing uh -huh. breaks <laughs> right. at 43,000 pounds because of how it's spliced, right? All the things I just talked about. But that's you. Okay. This is the guy they told you not to worry about. <laughs> I see your soft shackle is <laughs> so, slightly larger than mine. <laughs> so this soft shackle is exactly Whoa. the same soft shackle as the extreme duty. This is an inch and an eighth diameter rope, and this breaks at 294,000 pounds. <laughs> These things are now gonna go into heavy combines, uh, heavy wreckers, uh, military vehicles, that type of thing, and that's when you start mining equipment, right? So that's when this whole product line going from, would it be the Jeep size or off-road truck size, all the way up to these heavy wreckers and big industrial application vehicles. Dude, I wanna see like, uh... See, like you know, you know how guys get out and they kind of like talk about each other's cars and look at their tires and like somebody. I want to see like guys comparing recovery bags. Oh yeah. And one guy just be like, "Well, well, you guys, like that, guys. yeah, man, <laughs> pay up. Room, room. Beers on you. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty that's, cool, that's man. Incredible. It's, that is incredible. So this is my sawtooth bag. I noticed that the bags are different. Now it's uh, offered in a desert tan. Yeah. Because <laughs> what happens is is it's gonna get dirty, <laughs> yeah. right? So what we did is we actually now are making the bags locally. The bags are being made here in Boise, which oh, is awesome. really cool. Yeah. Um, we added a couple additional pockets. Um, we also added a couple of molly panels on the inside to also tie down other kind of pieces in the yeah, tops of the bags. That would be nice. Um, and then we also ran the molly strip across the entire outside of the bag where yeah, here before we just had a couple 
that were just on here. Yeah. Now this goes down the entire outside. Um, the other thing was is that we also uh, added Molly uh, to the outside of the bag where both of this bag just had a couple of pockets on either side, yeah. right? The manuals and all those things fit in here. But now, not only do you still have that same pocket on one side, uh, but you also get the additional pocket over here with additional Molly down here. And then we also gave you, because when you're going overlanding, Gave you the cool Velcro. Dude, yeah, strip. this needs to have a uh, every you know all your favorite overlanding yeah. patches on there. So that way now you've got that feature there as well. Yeah. Um, one of the other new things that we are releasing though is this guy, which is actually um, a 10 foot kinetic bridle. So what oh. this is for is actually to attach to two points of a vehicle, right, and then pull from the center of this. Now if you're using a static toe strap in between there, that you can soften that jerking motion by interjecting this into the yeah. system to give you a little bit more freedom uh, without jerking so the two vehicles around So you can turn a regular toe strap into something that has a little more flex with one of these. Exactly. Yeah. It's not gonna That's be, huge. it's not a kinetic pull, yeah. and you should never treat it that way. But what it will do is that as you're towing another vehicle, it'll stop that hard jerking motion yeah. and soften that. Yeah. And then in a kinetic pull, if you're gonna use this with a kinetic rope, it can help amplify that um, rebound when you're using that. Uh, yeah. in a kinetic pole as well. That's cool. Okay, let me, let me, let's go outside in the parking lot and I'll walk you through exactly what I did in this last kinetic rope recovery scenario. And you can tell me all the things that I did right and most of the things that I did wrong. Okay. <laughs> so let's go out there and, and set this up. Yeah, great. Cool. Okay, so in my recovery scenario, my Jeep, my Wrangler was in a mud bog and my Gladiator was behind it. And so what we chose to do is we chose to turn the Gladiator around so that it would pull me out of the mud, but it would be driving forward. So it would be driving forward, pulling me backwards because my thinking is we want who's ever doing the pulling to be going forward. That's better than the transmission, blah, 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 blah. So Justin's turning his rig around. He's gonna back up and I'm gonna show him exactly what I did and get his opinion on whether or not I did it right or wrong. And hopefully we'll have some lessons that we all learn together on the way. Okay, let's imagine that my Jeep is stuck in a mud bog and yours is here to tow me out. And this is what I have on me. I have my sawtooth recovery bag from Factory 5 on me. So what I do is I go to look at what could possibly help in this situation. So there's kinetic rope. There's two shackles in there, even though they're slightly different. There's uh, the hitch link and most importantly, there's a hitch pin. No, oh, yeah, I was gonna, so just like, gonna ask. <laughs> I don't know, does this come in the kit or is this, it you have to not. buy this? So it's worth its weight in gold because you're doing bump kiss without a hitch pin. Any hitch pin will work. We do offer a USA made quick release and um, locking Lock, hitch pin, yeah. right? Uh, but the only difference between our pins and any other pin that you can find is that these have actually been pole tested up to 55,000 pounds. Great, and yeah. they, ha they say factor 55 on yeah, them. Yeah, it's super cool. Really cool. Yeah. So first thing I did was hook up this. Oh my God, <laughs> super dirty. Okay, so did I do that right? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and then here's, here's, here's my thought. Here was, here's what I was thinking. I've got this kinetic rope. I've got two of these things. I do not have a, uh, a hitch recovery point on the Gladiator. I've only got the two side um, loops that come stock on it. So I looked at these two things and I said, this one should go in the hitch pin, this one should go on the hook. This thing, pretty easy to just slide through here. Okay, now, this is a really important um, learning point for me. How, how should it look? Should it look like this? It really doesn't matter. As long as you get the noose over top of the knot, that's the most important part of it, right? So I did it right. Yeah, you did, but there's also, there is one major screw up in this scenario you've already done. Okay, <laughs> what's that? Oh God, you're right. Okay, okay, okay. All right, in my defense, <laughs> I did have gloves on, but it wasn't nice gloves. They were just like mechanics gloves. And the only reason I actually had them on is because I had been digging in the mud. I didn't really think about putting gloves on in this situation because when you're working with this stuff, sometimes it's easier to have your fingers in hindsight, I definitely want to put my gloves on. Ideally, when you're thinking about setting up your rigging here, right, uh, one of the key phrases is to lock the knot, right? So if you're at the bottom of this and you're pushing up against this, you've got this noose around the bottom of the knot and this is gonna pull this direction. So there's no chance for this to slip over the knot, right? Personally, what I do a lot of times is depending on the scenario is I will always leave the knot in the middle 
end with the knot oh. facing up. And the only reason why I do that is because when I'm getting done with this, it's that much easier to get right to the middle, right, to open this up to get that to come off. What right? happens if you do it the other way, if you were to put it knot down? Um, so one, a couple of things uh, go into that theory. One is, is if the knot is facing like down, if you're coming through here and attaching to this, so this is opening up and going through here, right? And this is facing like down, for instance. One thing is depending on the grade and the hill that you, the knot could get hit on something, yep. right? So then that could damage uh, the end of the knot or damage your soft shackle by dragging on the ground there too. The other thing is that if you're pulling on this noose, the idea is that let's say if that loosened up, you're, le you're more likely uh, with um, the going back to not all soft shackles are made equal. Going back to where how this, these soft shackles, because of the way they're spliced, self-tighten under load. So some of the cheaper versions just bury right back inside of themselves. So if you don't cheat that all the way up to get that noose to go tight around that knot, what can happen is it can leave open a gap here. And if that gap is open and you're like this and it gets slack in tension, the, I, the theory is that the ball could potentially fall out of it, right? right? Now that doesn't happen with a good quality USA made soft shackle that's been spliced correctly and by positioning it correctly when you're doing a pull. But again, I do like having it in the middle. That's just a personal preference with the knot facing up. Okay, so then in this recovery scenario, I didn't have one of these. I only had one of these and it was a hook, but we can pretend that this is a hook. So now is a good time to tell you that there's a discount code in this video. So if you look in the description of this video, uh, Factor 55 has given me a discount code to give to you so you can go look at some of this stuff and if you like it you can get um, a break on the price so um, my advice to you is to definitely go to their website look through this stuff look at the recovery bags which i think are probably the best bet for somebody who's looking for kind of where do you start with recovery the sawtooth bag i think is probably the best recovery set that's out there right now so you can go get that with a discount code and save a little bit of money. These were my two connection points. So one off the hitch in the middle there, one off the side on a recovery hook. But I use this because this metal was rougher. How'd I do? We would never want to take a soft shackle and put it through a bumper tab if we can avoid doing that. Uh, but uh, with like the factory, um, the OEM, like the factory Jeep hooks that are on there, they're actually much smoother and a lot safer to do this. The only thing is, is that those hooks are more open and so we'll show you an example on the back of the 392 yeah. hook to kind of give that here in just a second yeah but uh again like for for story purposes this would work okay. and if i was literally this was the only option i had at that point i would do this but i take it one step further if i got a hitch and i got a factory hitch what's that hitch attached to i don't know the frame okay how's, it how's it attached to the frame I feel like I'm on a, I'm a quiz now. So this is all about that whole learning process, right? So let's say I had this, but I was really worried about screwing this up. Or yeah. what, what, you know, what could I do here? Well, it's attached through the, the cross member. Oh. So you can see here, the hitch is bolted to this, which is to the cross member, which is to the frame, right? right? So why couldn't you just take the soft shackle and run it around the cross member? So this is another way that you can utilize the soft shackle. Now, like, like we just saw, right? You want to be careful because, well, this steel bumper would be rubbing on this. So what's one of the other tools that you have in your kit that you don't know what to do with? Oh. So the shorty strap, this is literally- What's up, shorty? What up, shorty? <laughs> uh, so the shorty strap was invented for this exact reason. So all the ratings are exactly the same as you would find, right? In a, in a straight line pole, it's got a braking strength of 31,000 pounds. So in a basket configuration, which we're about to demonstrate, the working load limit is 12,400 pounds, and that's a five to one safety factor. So that means that in a basket configuration where you're grabbing onto the two eyes of this strap, this thing is gonna break at, well, what's 12, what's 12 four times five? That's I don't right. know, Justin, what is it? Yeah, Let's I do know. the math. 12,400 pounds times five, so the braking strength of this thing in a basket configuration is gonna be 62,000 pounds is the minimum braking strength. That should work. That can go around that same thing of that cross member. You now can grab these two eyelets together 
right through here, take your soft shackle, run that through this end, and then grab the end of your kinetic rope and feed this thing right through here, open this thing up, stuff the knot right between here, and now you've just set this up to where you've got 62,000 pound braking strength now in the strap in this configuration. You've got 43,000 pound braking strength with a soft shackle and over and close to 30,000 pounds of braking strength in just this kinetic rope all set up into your system. And you know that this thing now with this two, two layers thick, it's two ply of high dense polyester, you know that now you've integrated this strap in here and it's got all this extra protection to where if there was a lot of extra rubbing or something which potentially could damage the rope fibers, this can take a lot more of that abuse than, than the soft shackle can. And that is one of the key components that comes in the recovery kit. So the moral of this particular story, outside of like how to use this stuff, which is fantastic, is when you run into something that doesn't look quite right, look at your recovery gear. Like just stop for a second, think through it. Chances are if you have one of these bags, you've got something that will probably bridge you through so a friction point, a hard edge, or anything that might like ruin your day when you're doing a recovery scenario. Look at your bag and see what other options you have outside of just a soft shackle and just a kinetic rope. Let's pretend that this is the back of the Gladiator. And here's, here's what I'm thinking, and here's what made me nervous. So what I'm thinking is, this is a pretty good hook, actually, because I, I know now from you that hard edges are not good for any kind of rope material. Yeah, but you can feel how this is this is way softer and a way nicer radii yeah. than on this than versus a shackle tab where something could get pulled apart or damage. Yeah, them. this is not as milled and soft as Factor 55 stuff. But when I when I when I went to this, my that was my first thought is like, what are the edges like? And I thought, okay, it's going to be okay for this pull. So, all right, it's a not a closed loop. So I'm I'm hooking this around, I'm hooking it around, connecting it. There's one other thing that you could have done in order to just improve that scenario uh, even even that much more. Okay. And so that being is, and so let's say you've got this thing properly loaded, right? And you have this on here, okay? And you have this in that knot up, whether it's in the middle or loading the knot like this, uh, you know, knot up scenario that you have it in here. Yep. Well, what could you do to help to avoid any type of this being off there? Well, we all just saw you take your kinetic rope apart, right? Dude. I'm looking at them on the ground, right? I know what you're gonna say. So one thing is, is, that, uh, is a value is that these Velcro strap wraps that come with every single strap that comes in the kit and that we also sell separately, <laughs> which even this is a USA made part, the advantage of this thing, it's not just a simple Velcro strap wrap. You can see this uh, heavy duty stitching that's through there. That's a heavy duty powder coated ring that's in there. Uh, and then it also has this extra piece of Velcro in the middle because the advantage is, is what you can do with this is now, now not only can you wrap this around something quite large, but you can also pull this thing down onto something really tight and the Velcro still lays down over top of it, right? Yeah. That's one of the key things about just these little strap wraps. So in this scenario, what you could do is you then could take, and you can do this with zip ties too as well, but since you already have this out because you got to take the gear out, all you have to do is take this thing around here through the middle of the loop, right? Run this thing around here. It all depends on the anchor point, right? And be able to choke this thing down here, roll this thing around until you find an you know an area that's going to make this work to have this thing be bit on here. Yeah. And now where's that going to go? Oh man. That is so smart. So it's, now it's, when this gets the slack or goes off, it's, it's never going to, you know what I mean? It's, there's no potential for it to jump off the hook and you already had to take them off in order to put them right here. Okay, so now that Justin showed us some really great tips and techniques on how to connect these recovery pieces during a, a situation like this, um, I'm going to have him show us exactly how to set up a kinetic rope pull because I've had two recent scenarios where I was involved in a kinetic recovery and one of them, I really questioned whether or not it was effective. Um, and one of them I was in and I was doing the pulling or I was being pulled and it was, you know, it was really scary. And so I kind of want to walk through what we did versus what I saw with Justin and have him show us exactly how to do it right. So we all know the next time we're in that situation, what to do. All right, dude, so we've got a scenario right here where the rope is connected to both rigs, but there's a fair amount of slack in it. So 
Let me walk you through uh, a scenario that I saw recently. We we're on a pretty tough trail. There was land cruisers trying to recover each other up a slope. And what they did is they essentially just got the rope. Now they didn't do this, but I'm just simulating. Like it was a tight rope. So they started with it tight and they just tried to kind of pull each other as if it were just a normal toe strap and it was unsuccessful. So I want, may, maybe you can tell us maybe why that was unsuccessful. So a couple of things is like with a kinetic, with a kinetic rope, right? If that thing is, if that thing is taut and then going through here, right? It's not going to get as much stretch as it needs to, right? You need to get momentum in order to stretch the rope in order to allow the rope to rebound. That's what this thing is for. It's like a giant rubber band. So how much slack should you have? So that's a great question. We get asked that a lot. So it's actually in the manual. If you get into this, this is our basic guide to kinetic energy recovery and towing a disabled vehicle off-road. And so in here, not only will it walk you through, like uh, just in the first couple of pages, right? The whole recovery scenario and how a kinetic uh, extraction should work, uh, but it will also even give you the best ways to attach to vehicles and how to do those poles. Oh. But the big, the big key factor is in the slack that gets used. So we've isolated both of these as a level one and a level two pole. So you would start out with six feet of rope in slack in between. Hmm. And then if that's not working, then you can also go into uh, nine to 10 feet of slack on the ground. So what this means is like right now, we you know, we got uh, roughly that, probably that six feet of slack, you know what I mean, give or take, yep. right in between here. Like if this was taut, you know, you're talking about three feet, three feet. So what you would do with this is this is what you would try out first. So first off, you're gonna be in four low and in first gear, right? And you're gonna roll into the throttle with this slack because that's gonna give enough force to start to allow this to build and extract, build so, and extract. So you don't slam the gas. Don't you're slam the gas. You're saying you kind of, not feather it, but you roll it. Okay. But you're gonna roll into it, right? So four low, first gear, and you're rolling into the throttle. And once you do that, that's gonna give that, uh, that force in order to put this in to allow that stretch to happen and start to get that extraction. If that's not effective, in this scenario, you can do it as a game by inches. Right? It's a game of inches, right? So as long as it's moving and you're getting, you're getting those, that movement there, you don't need to just slam on it, right? So you need slack. So in my recovery situation where, I was, where Kate was pulling me out in the Jeep, we had probably about this much slack, maybe a little bit more, I don't know. But I, I was like, I think we need some slack because of the just- And uh, how many poles did it take? It took two, and this is, this is my okay. question. So uh, the, the frightening part to me was that she hit it, she didn't, she, she, I think she rolled into it. She didn't just slam on the gas. She hit it and there's this wonderful feeling when you're stuck where like you, you come unstuck a little bit, but I wasn't all the way out and it was still really deep. So she kind of hit it and then she let off the gas. She didn't keep going. And I was afraid that I was gonna roll back into the mud and pull her down with me. And so we were on the radio and I was like, you know, what, let, break where you are and then she hit it again and the second time she got me out. So I guess the, the scary part or the part that's unknown to me is how do you do that? Like what's the right way to kind of hit it, let off, or do you just kind of keep pulling out? The easiest way to explain this is with a kinetic pull, you're gonna go, it's gonna stretch and it's gonna rebound. Mm -hmm. And with a static strap, both vehicles, it's like a synthetic chain essentially, both vehicles move at the same time. Yeah. So in that scenario, especially if she's uphill from you uh, and even using a kinetic rope, if that pulled and then she's pulling, but then she starts to feel like she's getting bogged down, that means that you are no longer moving again. And that's exactly when you set to reset. But it's hard to say of when and when not to do that, yeah. because what if that had suction happened and then you were still moving, then she should have stayed on it and Got stayed it. in it, right? Okay. But because you were in the scenario that you are, she probably felt the vehicle stop and felt nervous. Yep. So she stopped, yep. which apparently obviously was the right thing to do. Yeah. Okay. So you always want to have communication between the vehicles, if you can, radios is the best, right? If you don't have communication devices, right? And you're, and you're between the two vehicles, and luckily you guys did, one other really big tip that you can do uh, in that scenario too, is also to allow the rope to start out, out here. Now, why do you think that that's important? Oh, that's brilliant. So you can both see it. You can just like look through your side view mirror and see it. And see it. So, so now, yeah. as you're looking, and either on comms or not, you can be looking in the mirror 
so you guys can see where this rope is to when it starts to come up and start to take that slack. So getting away from the two vehicles like that is another key thing about having that slack so you both can anticipate when the pull is gonna start happening and taking place. So that's another really big key kind of assessment to think in that scenario. Are there, is there anything else people should know or anything else I should know before I go into the next one? It's not about just having the stuff. Mm -hmm. It's about getting out and using it, prepping the winches, doing these things. Best to also talk about like airing the tires down, creating more room for that, for grip to happen, mm -hmm. to get more traction, clearing debris away from the tires, right? Like what if you had hit a rock in that little mud hole that was on your diff and hanging you up and you yeah. had no idea, yeah. right? Now, if you're just a neutral, I'm just pulling you against this rock instead of you trying to also get some assistance to get over it, right? Yeah. So you have to talk through every single scenario to make it, to get the easiest and best possible outcome. Yeah. Well. Justin, thanks, dude. Thanks for another yeah, like educational session. Yeah, man. And um, and this is why uh, Factor Fifty Five is such a great company because you guys live this. You live oh, this man. every day. This is what like obsessed. Yeah, like it's I walked obsession. in. I walked in earlier and I was just like waiting for you, and you were like doing some rope thing on showing somebody how the center point needs to be here and there, and it's it's a way of life for you yeah. and, and for the folks that work here. So yeah, it's been a, you know. it's been a be it's a it's a wonderful thing to be a part of, especially on that product development thing to really you know, dig deep in here, to problem solve, to make that not only be safer, number one, right, but also more effective and easier to do. So that way it eliminates a lot of this confusion because we build in those safety factors in every single product we manufacture and we're gonna make it so even if you have very little experience that you can still get the job done quickly, effectively, and especially safely. Now is another really great time to reiterate that there is a uh, discount code in the description of this video that will give you a discount at Factor 55. So if you wanna go check out some of this stuff, uh, use that discount code before you check out and you'll save yourself some money. So until next time, I'm Wolf of Venture to Rome. Thanks for watching.